okay, let's see. Everybody here in the back of the room? You hear okay? I can talk pretty loud, so I just want to make sure that we hear everything back here. I still got some people funneling in here, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Chris Farrow. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, injecting Trojan via patch management systems and other nefarious evil deeds and fun things to do in your spare time. Um, my co-presenter, Steve Manzik, wasn't able to be here. Uh, he gives his apologies. We had some travel misarrangements and getting him from here from Canada wasn't able to work out. But uh, I'd like to thank Jeff and the Black Hat crew for uh, getting us out here. Uh, we actually had submitted this uh, presentation for later in this year, hoping to go for maybe the, uh, the Black Hat USA briefings. Um, Jeff had a last minute cancellation, was able to bring us uh, in as a last minute fill in. Um, in your book, you will not find the presentation. It's not on your CD. It is posted out on the website though. So afterwards, if you want to pull down the presentation, the PDF should be sitting up there uh, with all the slides. Um, so for now, you'll have to scribble uh, or just pay attention. But uh, you don't have anything to follow along with inside the book there. What we want to basically talk about is, is kind of patch management systems, uh, software distribution systems that are used for patch management. We're going to talk about them in general, and we're going to talk about uh, general security issues with them. Uh, when the topic um, this topic came up for a presentation, we started doing some research, and we thought this would be just a uh, little quick research, go out, find some information, and, and we thought it may not be that interesting a topic. Uh, we were actually very surprised to find when we looked out, started doing some research, that there is very little published material on security audits of patch management systems. And we thought that very strange, considering that uh, pretty much all corporate enterprises have some type of patch management or software distribution system as part of their infrastructure. Matter of fact, it's a keen part of it because it is their single best remediation tool for fixing things in mass. When they need to push out patches or push ch configuration changes across the environment, this is usually the tool set that they uh, rely upon. So we found it rather strange that I couldn't go out and find any good exploits on various patch management systems. You know, uh, go out and query somewhere like uh, ICAT or somewhere, and even uh, big commercial systems like SMS over the last five years only have three published known uh, flaws, long patched. So uh, we thought it was rather interesting that there was no uh, data out there. So we decided to launch a kind of a research project to go out and look at various commercial software uh, patch management systems and software distribution systems and just take a look at and see, well, is there anything interesting to look at? You know, is there uh, something interesting that could be done? Can you uh, cause a little mayhem with them? Is there some work that vendors need to be doing to, to bring these patch management systems up to snuff? As it turns out, there's uh, quite a bit of interesting information and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here. Um, and we'll be talking about various uh, points along the way. Basically, we're going to talk about patching in general, patching why it's uh, such a pain in the butt, why it doesn't work right now, why customers, uh, large organizations have such a huge problem with it. We're going to take a look at a particular patch. Today we are going to talk a lot about Microsoft because Microsoft generates the majority of patches out there. It's the majority of boxes in the corporate enterprise, so it's the topic that comes up most often. Uh, so we'll look at a typical Microsoft patch. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, the generic package where you get it from, you know, how it's digitally signed, all that kind of good stuff. Um, we're going to take a look at the process of patch management and where there's some serious kind of flaws and how a lot of companies have this implemented. And we're going to take a look at the technology and in particular we're going to look at uh, the two general types of technology which would be the patch management specific type tools and uh, the software distribution type provisioning type tools that customers wind up using for patch management as a course of business. And we're going to look at uh, both the process and the system and how they work and some areas of concern. And we're we'll look at other generic kind of design and implementation flaws. A lot of the flaws that we've discovered so far have to do with uh, bad default settings and poor implementation processes. But there are some specific tools with specific problems that do some really bad behaviors um, and that I think you'll be rather surprised to hear about. Um, then because it's Black Hat and we want to have fun, we don't want to just talk about the, the the, what the problems might be. We want to talk about, you know, what are some possibilities to actually maybe exploit some of these problems. So we're going to look at a couple of scenarios, both from an internal standpoint and from an external standpoint, of how we might be able to uh, cause some havoc, leverage a patch management system or software, software distribution tool to uh, go ahead and cause some problems 
maybe get some changes pushed out to the environment that we don't want pushed out there, or at least the IT guys don't want pushed out there. Um, and then after that, uh, we're going to take a look at just some generic other miscellaneous evil deeds that you can do with this, not just messing with uh, the patch payload and, and trying to get Trojan packages out there, but some other interesting things you can do out there uh, to uh, disrupt patch management processes in the environment. And uh, then, of course, in a responsible manner, we'll finish off by talking about a, a few simple things that somebody could have half a clue about and put the system in place or at least help fix some things. Uh, these are things that could easily be done without the vendors actually getting their act in gear and actually fixing some things. Just some quick uh, background info. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking bios and backgrounds and good stuff like that. I've worked for a lot of good software companies. I've had pleasure of working with uh, some of my compatriots here from uh, BindView. I've worked at NetIQ, uh, Intrusion.com. I'm currently working, uh, doing research at ConfigureSoft. Um, lots of good companies. There's a lot of good vendors out there. Um, me personally, I just like working in the software industry, and I really get a lot of fun out of taking regular off-the-shelf products and kind of twisting them to make them do things they're not supposed to do. I actually think that's actually a pretty good hobby. I think that's uh, very interesting. Um, most interesting one I've seen, most my favorite tool, toy, or talk recently. Uh, I know a few guys in here I was with out at uh, Schmoocon. Anybody? Schmoocon? Got some Schmoo goods. So if you missed Schmoocon, you missed a great uh, first Schmoocon out in Washington, D.C. Uh, very good, small, cheap, good technical talks. One of the best presentations I saw was uh, Kaz. Uh, his Snort Plus Pro Plus Metasploit talk was an interesting talk. You know, anybody who wants to take Network IDS and turn it into an attack vector uh, or turn it into a patch management system, I thought that was really original, really good stuff. That was uh, you know, probably the most interesting uh, talk I saw while I was out there. Um, I checked just last night uh, because it wasn't actually on the ShmooCon disk, uh, and so it's not actually on the website either, so you have to actually mail uh, the guys at Shmoo if you want to get a copy of Kaz's presentation. Uh, but I'd highly recommend it if you need something to do, read on the airplane on the way back. Uh, I think it's called uh, When ID IDS Gone Bad is the title of the presentation. Uh, very interesting talk there. I have to give major kudos to Steve Manswick. Uh, a lot of you know Steve. Uh, Steve's worked with uh, several organizations. He's presented at Black Hat and DEF CON before. Um, he's the uh, founder and moderator on Volnwatch. Um, this is mostly Steve's uh, presentation here. Uh, Steve did a lot of the initial research on a lot of the initial work. And like I said, Steve, we had some travel arrangements we couldn't get to happen right to get Steve here. So Steve needs major kudos because Steve's done a lot of the grunt work on here. And as we continue through this research, uh, Steve's going to be helping. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of it together, but Steve's going to be doing a lot of the grunt work. I also have to give a special thanks to a gentleman named Tracy Alpers. Tracy Alpers is one of the best Microsoft patch management guys I know. The guy does patch management for a living. That's all he does, period, and has experienced more pain uh, dealing with uh, patches on a uh, now monthly basis, uh, working with Microsoft on why the patches work this way and why they don't work this way, and uh, discovering all kinds of interesting things of undocumented switches and uh, interesting uh, behaviors of their installer package. So I want to make sure Tracy gets uh, his due. Tracy's locked at a desk in Colorado, and he never gets to come to cool cons like this, so uh, give him a little uh, appreciation from the background there. Standard disclaimer here. So. Uh, because I am commercially employed with a software vendor and I do like my paycheck, uh, we're behaving by a few rules uh, for today. Uh, one, this is a research project that's still in progress. Like I said, we started off this project uh, initially submitting it for a later uh, talk for uh, later in the year, and we were able to, uh, to work with uh, Jeff and the Black Hat guys to get as a last minute fill in here for Amsterdam. Uh, so we still have a lot of work that has to be done. We haven't made it through all of the 20 plus. Uh, commercial software vendors who claim to be doing patch management yet. Um, anybody that would come up with a, a verified flaw, we're going to be uh, trying to do the responsible thing, working with them, trying to give them a shot to, to get it fixed um, and uh, do the right thing by them. Um, no specific vendor or product and their specific flaw that we've already verified will be discussed here today um, because none of the vendors that we've talked with and a lot we haven't talked with yet have put out a patch yet. Um, so that in accordance also, there might be some times we talk about vendors. Just because we talk about the vendor doesn't mean they have a specific flaw. There's 20 plus patch management vendors out there. And just because I say Microsoft doesn't mean Microsoft has uh, a flaw with 
uh, this type of security or that type of security. Uh, we'll be using Microsoft as a lot of examples because they're the ones that most people are familiar with from the patch management standpoint. Now, the caveat is, if this is already public information, I had no problem slamming somebody. So if they've got a flaw and they haven't addressed it, then it's fair game. So uh, we're just not going to uh, uh, single anybody out quite at the moment. Um, any of the flaws we talk about here probably and definitely in some cases do apply to multiple vendors. Uh, so there are a lot of people who, who have copied each other. We'll talk about the different patch management vendors. Uh, many of the patch management guys selling out there are just OEM from the same product anyhow. Uh, so it kind of compounds the problem. They got a bug and all of a sudden seven different companies are selling the same bug. So, um, and there is not an exploit out in the wild. Uh, because we jumped early up, earlier up in the year, we don't have a proof of concept Trojan patch tested and working yet. Uh, but I guarantee you with some of the information we found out there, somebody can do an exploit pretty easily. Uh, some of this stuff is, is embarrassingly bad. So um, expect to see some interesting things going on there and some ex interesting code coming out either by itself or in combination with some other projects. So in general, we'll start off with just talking about patch management. So in, in the general question of why patch management, you know, well, duh, I mean, we have uh, lots of problems out there. IT guys generally want to keep the boxes secure. They want to improve uptime. One of the problems I have in general with patch management as a topic is that way too many IT guys are treating patch management as kind of holy grail material. Uh, they think patch management is uh, the silver bullet to security. If I had the box patched, the box must be secure. And uh, it, it's such a fallacy that guys are constantly stunned with boxes getting owned when they were, oh, we're, we're up to date on all the patches. And uh, sometimes they just don't get the fact that the patching is just fixing broken code and it doesn't necessarily address all the security avenues into a box. You know, how big is this problem? Well, everybody knows about the stuff you do day to day, right? So we, we work for companies, we consult to companies, but we have workstations, we have servers, we have more challenging problems with laptops. You know, I've worked with lots of customers who have uh, two, 3,000 laptop users traveling around the country, hopping in and off the network. And how do I get a patch out to them when I have no idea when the guy's going to be on the network next? And I can't just send a big recall signal out and make sure that um, the guy comes running in back into the office, turns in his laptop to IT so I can get him patched. I'm not going to tell him to come in once a month to do that. Um, so it's kind of challenging. Laptop guys are plugging into hotels and open wireless access here at the airport. And we all know nothing ever happens to, you know, wireless at the airport, <laughs> Wi-Fi at your hotel. That's perfectly secure, right? You know, everybody surfs on the wireless. It's a good thing, right? So that's what, that's what your sales guys think. That's what your accountants think. That's what the executives of your companies think. They plug it in. They turn it on. They get access. And they get to go do whatever business stuff they're going to do. But there's lots of other things out there. The biggest one happening on the commercial side, handheld devices. Nobody's doing patch management for handheld devices. What's one of the most popular handheld OSs running out there? You know, Microsoft Mobile, you know, PDA OS. Uh, sell a lot of boxes, right? You may not like it, but they sell a lot of boxes. You know, who's patching them? Nobody. Uh, most people don't even know about them. I can run down to the electronics store and buy that little PDA and bring it into my office. Um, what about on the consumer side? You know, we all, we all hear the stories about bad end users, bad consumer guys, everybody running home versions. There's still, uh, by some estimates, more than a million uh, Win 9X boxes running live on the internet out there. Uh, who's patching these guys? You know, I'm, I'm, everybody's not just uh, happily running an you know, OSUS and getting perfect patch management and have these boxes locked down. But there's all these other fun things coming up at home. Anybody got, uh, I know a couple, I've seen a couple of people. Who's got your uh, PDA OS phone, right? You know, we're starting to see real interesting stuff happening to handhelds on phones, right? So uh, various viruses and malware, uh, security flaws happening on phones happens more and more, faster and faster. Nobody's really addressing them really well right now. Um, how about your cable set-top box or your satellite set-top box? You saw that news article, Microsoft just signed a huge contract uh, in the United States, they're going to be providing some 1 million uh, uh, set-top boxes, one of the largest cable companies in the U.S., and it's going to be based off of the Windows operating system. So now I've got a uh, wonderful network going coast to coast uh, with coax cable running to every house in the United States, and it's on the network, and it's running Microsoft. But that usually wouldn't be a problem because you just a separate network, right? Because, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have our cable system hooked up to our home network, would we? 
Well, of course we would, because we do internet over cable. We have cable modems now. And we have things like media center PCs. Hey, let's take a dumbed down PC to serve MP3s and videos. Uh, you know, my home do-it-yourself TiVo box. I'm going to plug that on the network, too. My home network and my cable network. So I've got another box that needs to be patched out there. Xbox. No problems, at least widespread, you know, no big hacks. Uh, unintentional, well, let's see, no nefarious hacks on Xbox. We've all done great hacks on Xbox to get to do what we want. But uh, the new version of Xbox uh, coming out is basically a big, giant media PC. It's going to do all kinds of fun things. It's not just a gaming system anymore. Microsoft doesn't want to be a gaming system. Microsoft wants to be your, your DVD player, your, your movie player. He wants to be TiVo. He wants to be everything. So uh, Xbox 2 or whatever the next gen Xbox coming out at the end of this year has got a lot more high-tech toys and on the network. So we've got all kinds of wonderful places. The problem gets bigger and bigger. And we have companies running out there with 50,000, 75,000, 100,000 nodes on the network. It's a really big problem out there. So patch management in general, um, is X class of app kind of mission critical? It's absolutely mission critical. You can't patch a 50,000 workstation environment by manual you know, guys are doing you know, login scripts. You've got to have some type of tool that can scale, that can distribute uh, data in mass and it has to be accurate and has to be able to roll back and it's like I said before this is the primary remediation tool for most organizations bad worm A hits what do they use to roll out the patch they use their patch management or software distribution tool JPEG vulnerability came out what am I using to patch it they don't have 50,000 workstations all going up live to windowsupdate.com and downloading a patch no they're using SMS they're using Altiris they're using Shavlik or St. Bernard or Novadime. They're using a commercial tool to track these patches, control the, the rollout of this, and push them across the organization. So patch management, definitely a huge mission critical app. And if you break it, it has serious consequences. Now patching in general should be a real simple concept, right? Software break, put the patch out there, problems fixed. It should be easy, right? Not. This is one of the hardest things to get done right in a large organization. And we've had tons of opportunities and tons of resources to get patch management right. But for some reason, it's still a massive problem. Just like antivirus. How long have we had antivirus out there? AV's been around, you know, good commercial grade uh, antivirus for 10, 15 years. We still have problems. It hasn't solved the issue. It doesn't stop malware. It doesn't stop uh, the spread of viruses and worms. Problem's still there. You think after taking uh, smart people and putting on a problem for 15 years, we can solve it, right? Patch management is one of these areas where it hasn't been solved yet. So in terms of patching expertise, there's not a lot of training going on on patching, proper patching, uh, infrastructure design, uh, the way tools should work, proper tools. There's not a lot of books. You can't go out to Amazon and find a whole plethora of books. There's no patching in a nutshell from O'Reilly. Uh, these resources don't exist. So the way your IT guys learn is by experimenting on production networks. They take a tool, they blast a patch out, it works, great. If it doesn't work, a bad thing. If they crash boxes, you know, a really bad thing. And they struggle to get it fixed and they re-ghost things and blow images back out there. You know, have things gotten easier for us? You know, my favorite line was, I remember when uh, Microsoft was coming out with Windows 2000 and Active Directory was announced. And there's all this marketing going around about how Microsoft is going to make IT so easy for us. It's going to be so simple. And then all the IT administrators started taking classes and reading books and, and diving down into AD and GPOs and the way policies are supposed to work and the way they really work. And it turns out the complexity from the IT end of the management side you know, blew way out the window. Microsoft's tried really hard in the last couple of years to address you know, security. They're trying to address bugs a whole lot better. But is it making a whole lot of difference yet? Yeah, a little bit. So, you know, out of the box, you know, XP or 2003 is, is better than Win9X. Uh, just last night, I think it was last night, uh, Win2K, uh, the serv new service pack came out. So now Win2K3 uh, Win uh, now has firewall, uh, now has all kinds of uh, interesting new security pieces in there. So all of a sudden, organizations around the world are all talking about how they're going to roll out new Win2K3 uh, server patch, right? Big service pack. And it's a huge one because it's introducing a ton of new functionality. It changes rules on DCOM and RPC, has a firewall that's turned on by default like uh, XPSP2. All of a sudden, they have to worry about pushing this out and how it's going to infect their environment. How hard does Microsoft work? Well, 
In 2002, we had 154 security patches. These are specific patches for security flaws tied to a security bulletin, not uh, and a specific office patch or some type of uh, application patch that may have affected uh, uptime, but specific security pieces. 2003, 174. 2004, 172. Now, some people have been saying, oh, well, Microsoft's patches have been going down. Not so. The number of security bulletins Microsoft releases has gone down. That's a marketing ploy. Uh, what you do is you just release a bulletin and have multiple patches in there. So if I only have 55 bulletins released in the year, it sounds like a nice smaller number. Number of actual patches for the platforms released have increased. Now, in this time period also, uh, you saw a lot more larger adoption of XP, Windows 2003 server coming on. Uh, so they have a lot larger um, maybe target area or surface area to have to patch. Uh, but they also retired patch support for Windows NT4. Anybody in here still work for an organization or consultant organization where NT4 server or workstation is still present? I know it is. You're lying if you say otherwise. Especially in Europe, NT4 uh, has made uh, a stronger hold in there. Microsoft has officially stopped patching support for NT4. Though if you're on special like Premier support contract, they'll still do patches for you. Uh, and you'll see when we talk about the patch management vendors, that's an important thing because most patch management vendors have dropped NT4 support a long time ago. And matter of fact, Microsoft solutions for Windows, it was SUS, then it was WUS, now it's uh, Windows Software Update Services, so WSUS, uh, and SMS, neither one of those support what they consider the down-level client. So uh, if you're running NT4, uh, you know, SMS isn't a real good tool for patching, uh, pushing out there. One of the other problems out here is that there are, are very few standards for patches. Other than Microsoft, who you know, kind of has uh, uh, the monopoly on the patch management space, and not, not by their choice, but uh, um, there are very few standards out there. So if you roll out a Microsoft patch, they're very standardized. Uh, they're, they're easy to predict, at least in terms of what you would expect Microsoft to do. However, when you go see a patch from uh, Adobe, if you go see a patch from some ERP, system, if you want to go see a patch for a web server or any third party system, they basically use whatever they want. And they might sign it and they may not sign it. And they might be using Macrovision's installer tools and they might be using an MSI package and they might be using whatever they darn well feel like. So it's very hard uh, to kind of plan for those and adjust for those. And why you see a lot of patch management vendors don't do a lot of third party patching support. Usually stick to the Microsoft applications, Microsoft OS, with a few vendors crossing into cross platform. Uh, but in terms of the you know, 50,000 plus Windows applications out there that aren't written by Microsoft, a patch can be anything you want it to be. They might have something cool like uh, an antivirus live update technology where they can drop stuff to you. Or they might tell you you have to go to a website and download a patch, manually run an install. Some companies just make you do an upgrade. You basically do a rip and replace and put the whole new fixed version in there. So very few standards out there. So it's another thing that causes patching to be very hard in a complex, real world type environment. And speaking of complexity, that is really kind of one of the toughest things to deal with from a patch management standpoint. This isn't a simple thing of taking, you know, 5,000 machines with vanilla installs, running new applications, and throwing a patch out there. Well, all I have to test is maybe, you know, a couple of components. We run dozens, if not, you know, multiple, you know, tens, 30, 40, 50 applications, uh, workstation or on a server. We have web-enabled applications. We've got web services going on. We've got client-server custom develop stuff in-house. We've got old DOS stuff that we can't get rid of, and we got, you know, stuck in 16-bit hell. We've got all kinds of applications out there and trying to figure out how all those applications interact with each other and how one patch dropped in that environment is going to impact anything uh, is a tough job. Uh, we have a very complex IT environment. These aren't simple networks. Uh, they're all interconnected, and everybody from the secretary to the CEO needs all kinds of interesting access to their online expense system, email, their news tickers, uh, and any kind of you know the other applications they might run into. So uh, complexity is very hard. And one of the challenges we have complexity is that most of these patch management and software distribution systems have very limited view of the configuration data out there. Most tools do very simple things like Where's the box? What's your name? What OS are you running? What service pack you're running? Ready, go. They don't take a look at, you know, well, what's the registry look like on that box? What other software is running on that box that I might want to know about? Do I have to have enough damn disk space on that target box for me actually to get the patch over there and run it? Do I have the right credentials and authority to actually install the patch and make it stick? 
you know, I copy the binary over and I try to write the patch and it's supposed to write a registry key, I don't have registry permissions on there and then the patch fails. Uh, depending on the tool, it may or may not tell you that the tool actually successfully put the patch out there because it dropped the binary, but it didn't actually put it in the registry and the patch isn't active yet. Or maybe it rolled all that out there, but it never got to the reboot, so the patch isn't running uh, on code that's in memory yet. Complexity is really hard, and that's why you can't really do patch management well from a manual process. Now, the scale of enterprises we're dealing with are a lot you know, more challenging ever than before. Everybody, especially this year, you know, uh, if you got a checkbook, everybody's buying everybody. You know, uh, you know, Semantic has a personal mission right now. They're going to buy all the companies out left in the IT market so they can go have a one-on-one -on -one war with Microsoft. Um, all kinds of big mergers going on. The petroleum industry, telcos, banks, everybody's buying each other. We're in that cyclic, you know, we do expansion, decentralize, we come back and centralize again. We're going back in the era of these big mega corporations. Corporations with, you know, 37,000 workstations and 7,000 servers. We're talking, you know, multi-continent, uh, geographic, multi-time zone, massive distributed organizations uh, where it's not a simple shop with five guys in charge of patch management. You've got guys all across the country, different countries, different languages, different politics. It's very challenging to get this stuff done. And uh, most of the people having the big problems with patch management are these mega corporations, not the mom and pop stores down the street. The last thing really that makes patching hard is what we call shift, drift, and shadow IT. So shift and drift just basically talks about if you have a machine roll out in a production environment, um, the longer it's in a production environment, the least likely it's in the state you think it is. Everybody does a, a disk image or some kind of provisioning. We roll the box out the way it's supposed to be. We think we have it hardened. And as soon as we roll it out there, things start changing. You know, different administrators play with the box. Different applications get rolled out. Different things change. Different applications, new patches every month. We get in, you know, another patch from Microsoft. Things change. The boxes very rarely stay in the state we think they're in. And you know, uh, an IT guy can come in, install an exchange server, set it up, and harden it. The exchange administrator's job is to make sure the mail runs. And so if he wants to come in there and start tweaking settings to make performance run better, he doesn't really have an understanding about if he's opening up that box to be you know, a relay or not. You know, he may not be a security guy at all. Uh, his job is to make sure that mail works. So uh, shift and drift just is part of the IT challenge we have every day. Boxes get hired, you know, people get hired, new boxes come online. Uh, we get rogue boxes out there. People get fired and boxes go off the network. The other problem is shadow IT. Uh, there's some good studies out there. Some 25% of all IT activity in most uh, major organizations happen outside of the regular uh, IT group. So you have independent groups who buy their own PCs, manage own parts of their network, control their own applications, maybe handle their own IT. My first IT job, I worked for an HMO in uh, Denver, Colorado, and uh, for six years, uh, we were in the pharmacy department, so uh, pharmacy ran their own IT. We had our own Unix boxes, we had our own systems, but we did everything on our own. The only thing we didn't do on our own was our own telecom. So, I mean, we called the, tele we called the you know, network guys if we needed uh, new lines run, but we ran everything else ourselves, including our own backups, our own security, our own logs, everything. Uh, that happens a lot in organizations. A lot of times, the corporate you know, IT guy who's supposed to be auditing and blessing things finds out about it after the boxes are already on the wire. This happens a lot, especially if you're a really decentralized, distributed organization. Uh, you know, your headquarters is in Chicago and you've got uh, operations in Tangiers. Depending on the organization, those may or may not be real employees. They may be contractors. The further away you are from home base, the least likely you, know, you might have control over them. So things happen where boxes get purchased, put online, and installed, and then somebody gets the paperwork filled out later. Uh, so th it's, it's a hard problem because I've yet to go to a customer um, and do any kind of discovery on the network and find out that they knew every box that was on the wire. Never happens. You do a discovery out there and you come back and say, okay, so uh, how many servers do you have? Oh, we have uh, 750 uh, Windows 2000 servers and uh, 10 SQL servers and two web servers. And you come back, you know, okay, well, you've got actually, you know, 400 more boxes than that. Uh, you got everything from NT4 to Windows 2003, and there's actually, you know, 17 SQL servers out there. Always happens. There's always boxes popping up on the wire that customers don't know about. Um, and that's really not a fair uh, state to be in. It's, it's hard enough to patch boxes you know about. If you don't know about them, it's really hard to, to do something about them. Things like uh, the Spider Worm, uh, SQL Slammer, a lot of customers 
the biggest challenge was they were finding out uh, being hit by boxes that were infected they didn't even know about. We didn't know we had those SQL boxes. We didn't know where that was running MSDE. Nobody told us that was an MSDE box. You know, how could we patch it? So that's not fair. These are the things that make patching really hard. So being good vendors, being good software people, where do you want to build software products? Places that solve problems. You have big problems, that's a good place to build a solution. So, of course, software vendors uh, want to build software uh, management, patch management types of tools out there. And one answer, I always get an objection. Somebody will come back and say, oh, well, but, you know, we have provisioning. We ghost things out there. We do ghost. We have Altiris. We have some bare metal provisioning tool. You know, we, we, we have standard images and we roll these out so we know all our boxes are, are good and clean. So let me tell you why provisioning doesn't work or doesn't solve the problem and why provisioning is just another tool in the toolkit that fills its niche but is not, not the answer here. Um, first of all, you have to build your standard. You have your standard image. You've built it. You've tested it. you made sure it's compatible. The problem is, is that as soon as you roll the standard out, the standard's no longer any good because I can roll out a patch on a Monday, or I can roll out the image on Monday, Tuesday Microsoft releases a whole bunch more patches, all of a sudden now I have images all over my environment that are no longer the target image, no longer my ideal image. Images constantly have to be up to date. It's a great starting place, it's a great baseline, but the image never stays up to date. So you constantly have to go back and create new images. The problem is, is creating new images takes a lot of time. I have to go back, build a new image, test it, make sure it doesn't break anything, and then go out and roll images out all over again. Same problem as patch management. It's basically creating double the work as a patch management scenario where I have to go back and distribute the stuff all of these other boxes. The standard thing I get back from people who are relying heavily on provisioning is, well, if the machine goes down, you know, if it breaks, we'll just ghost it, right? So that's a, the, the standard answer. We'll just ghost it. You know, the workstations who care about that, I can just ghost it. The problem is, is, is organizations who take the, the basic stance that, oh, if the machine's down, we'll just spend five minutes and, and ghost it back. Basically, all you've done is restore the box to the vulnerable image that just got compromised. So if I have a box that's been trojaned, I have a box that's got spyware that's spreading all kinds of love across the network, and my answer is I'm just going to ghost it back, all you've done is just put a vulnerable box back on the network. Uh, so instead of taking the time and actually doing the right thing, most organizations will just push the magic button and multicast a bunch of images back out there. Hey, your workstations are back up for X period of time, but all you've done is create this basically perpetual sitting depth. You're just asking to be hacked again. So um, it doesn't solve the problem. It's a very short-term fix. Provisioning is just something that needs to be mixed in with the rest of, uh, of configuration and change management out there. It's a great place to start, and it works great for baselining, getting the, the fresh, good image out there to start with. But maintenance of that image ongoing out there is a whole other subject. And that's where patching and software distribution tools uh, usually get mixed in there. So in general, you know, patching, great, mandatory. I'm never going to tell you that patching isn't necessary. Uh, you've got to have it out there, but the people who are taking uh, you know, too much liberty with saying you know, patching is, is job number one or it's one of the most important uh, things for security. You know, they're giving it kind of silver bullet status. You know, patching addresses none of these things. Patching doesn't address anything about the security of the box other than broken code. You know, patching won't pass you past a SANS top 20. It uh, won't get you past a CIS benchmark. Uh, any kind of uh, you know, real assessment of the security, patching only addresses a very small part of it. And, and so in general, you know, patching doesn't equal uh, security on the box. It's just one of the steps to get your uh, self quite a ways along there. But I found lots of organizations out there, especially in the last two years, patch management's been like the hot topic. Everybody's buying patch management because they think it's the single biggest, you know, improvement they're going to do to security. And it, it generally doesn't have the return they're expecting out there. Patching also doesn't address a lot of things. Um, custom apps, web applications, uh, SAP, Siebel, things like that. There's, there's no, you know, uh, patch management package pre-built to go out there and manage uh, Siebel patches out there. It doesn't exist. Uh, so you got to create one yourself and tweak it and mess with it. And when we look at these software distribution packages, the create yourself uh, is strategy is actually going to cause one of the big problems that we have out here. So let's take a look at a Microsoft patch. Again, we're not picking on Microsoft. Um, Microsoft's put a lot of work into this. They still have a lot of work to go, but actually, uh, in a lot of assessments so far, Microsoft actually does a lot of good stuff in a lot of good areas regarding the patch process and the technology out there. Um, in general, from a Microsoft patch standpoint, uh, you get a digitally signed binary from Microsoft. 
Uh, Microsoft does a relatively good job on that. Uh, the digitally signing, um, whatever the first package is that you download. So if it's the binary itself, it's digitally signed. If it's the CAB file, digitally signed. Verify, VeriSign's authenticating it, all's good. Now, I didn't see anybody talking about SHA-1 at the conference this weekend, but Microsoft's using SHA-1 still, so that might be changing you know, sometime in the future here. But um, nobody has you know, access to supercomputer resources at the moment, so uh, they may not be able to do anything about that. Um, at least we're messing with the, any digital signatures right now. Uh, the other extras you get with a Microsoft patch is you get um, the CAB file, which is actually usually just it's the MS Secure XML file. The XML file you get has all the descriptive information, all the rich text, has all the information that you see bubbled up in like a security bulletin, tells you what the patch is, what OS it applies to, generic stuff, what the patch is going to do. Uh, you also get the security bulletin. Uh, so the security bulletin um, actually, you know, Microsoft has gotten uh, quite good at kind of the descriptive information they do on bulletins. So everybody should be familiar with this, right? So the Microsoft famous security bulletin, the stuff that you get pestered with at least once a month, uh, except for March, for whatever reason we took March off, because it's Easter, I guess. Um, so does anybody actually believe that there were no security holes in a Microsoft uh, application or there are no patches to be pushed out and that Microsoft got a free vacation in March? Did March like was National Security Month for Microsoft or something? Um, it, it just was convenient that we didn't have to do patches out there. But um, in general, you get uh, description information, uh, you get uh, some recommendations, you get severity ratings, you get the descriptive information, um, some information on the affected software, which platforms it'll go out to, um, affected components. Uh, so not just the whole box, but I mean what specifically on the box you might be touching. Um, some more information in general in terms of, uh, of uh, what's going on and what's breaking out. Now some of the good stuff, one, Microsoft actually fully supports CVE notation. Uh, so they actually take the vulnerability and throws out a CVE or candidate number. Uh, so they actually have a real numeric reference number out there. Um, they also you know, will give you some uh, uh, generic information on there. Uh, though if you want to look for more information, you're going to have to go link out there and, and track it down. Uh, and then, of course, the, the good things they always do, at least uh, in, in recent years, I know this has been uh, pulling teeth. I know when uh, some of the guys uh, from Razor have done work with Microsoft and, and working with them and creating the bulletins and the patches and getting things fixed right is a big pain in the butt. But uh, at least they're nice enough to give you know, people credit for who did all the work and uh, that type of stuff. So, and then they'll give you some uh, other generic information, support, and other resources to go look up stuff. Uh, so in terms of reference information, uh, they do a relatively good job. They won't throw everything themselves in the bulletin, but at least they give you the links so you can know where to go look for the stuff. Uh, I still don't think Microsoft references bug track numbers, but at least they do uh, CVE references, so you can lose, use that as a good index uh, to go look that up. Uh, the CAB file itself, first you get the CAB file. CAB file is just a, you know, their self-extracting little package. Uh, you get the the XML in there, the uh, XML itself, which gets larger and larger all the time. So your standard uh, XML, detailed information, reference numbers, and uh, the, the service packs affected products, things out here. The XML is very important. The XML is used by almost every software distribution or patch management system uh, to get its information about the patches that are available, what platforms they affect, uh, and uh, where they should be applied. So it's, it's a reference file that's used by most all of the software tools out there. Um, and most people are pulling it directly from uh, Microsoft. Though there are some people, like I said, who OEM stuff, and they will actually get it from somebody else. Now, as I mentioned before, third party patches is a whole other deal. There is no standard. So my patch for Adobe is different from my, uh, my patch for Dreamweaver and different from my patch for some off-the-shelf, you know, third-party web server that nobody's ever heard of. And so there is no real standard or methodology that you can expect to get a file on. Uh, whether they deliver it to you live, whether they send you a disk, there's still people who will, the only way you get the patch is they got to send you it on CD-ROM. Um, hopefully they're not sending it on floppies anymore. Um, most of the patches are too big to fit probably there anyhow. Um, they can send it to you know, live enabled uh, drop down stuff for you out there. A lot of vendors make you do rip and replace. So rip and replace uh, tends to be a bad thing, especially if you've installed a lot of these applications out there. 
Uh, that's why, in general, third-party patches, because they vary uh, so greatly, there's very little support in the patch management tools for these. Um, and the guys who do do third-party patches will do very small subsets. They'll pick a, a handful of very popular applications, and that's it. So anything that falls out of that realm, you've got to come up with your own strategy. You know, manual, GPO, whatever, login scripts, uh, build your own packages. Now, the last thing that goes along with kind of the Microsoft patches is uh, the concept of Patch Tuesday, or I like to call it Microsoft's time of the month. Um, once a month, uh, sometimes more than once a month, you know, we get the visit from our little friends at Microsoft. Uh, sometimes this is a bad thing because uh, they can drop rather large numbers. Like, anybody remember back in the fall when they hit us with like 21 patches in one month? They were patching everything from A to Z and they decided to do it all at once. Uh, no, not a whole lot of fun, especially if you had to be the guy who tested all those patches in your environment. Um, but in general, Microsoft you know, went to this new concept uh, a while ago to try to streamline and settle down the process. It was rather unpredictable before. They were just kind of rolling out the patches left and right. And the, there's two big benefits from this. Most of it's on Microsoft's side, so they get to control the flow of this a lot more often. Uh, the other benefit is on the IT side. Uh, it helps you schedule your IT resources a little bit better. I mean, at least you know when you're going to get smacked upside the head. Uh, except every now and then when there's the, the occasional, oh my god, this is way too important, we're going to go ahead and release it in the middle of the month with no notice. Uh, so every now and then that does happen, but those have been pretty rare. Um, so Patch Tuesday in general, there's a whole patch management project or process that goes on with Microsoft in terms of, you know, they're, they're notified, uh, they have to go out and validate, they test, they build, they fix, and eventually get to the point where they can release the patch. Now, uh, I don't know if anybody saw the, the um, email newsletter that went out. There's an article maybe a month or so ago, Microsoft talked about their um, beta partner test program or their, their trusted vendors, you know, security update verification program. Basically, Microsoft has uh, trusted numbers of vendors that go around that help them actually test patches. They basically uh, call it extended QA. Um, let somebody's eyes, other than Microsoft, look at the binary, look at the XML, look at the the bulletin and make sure they're not screwed up, do a little testing on them, send feedback to Microsoft. So it's just kind of like a second level QA uh, before it gets rolled out, um, which is kind of a good deal. Um, but in general, the biggest problem I see with the Patch Tuesday is, is Microsoft's still holding on to it. So they keep this stuff under wraps. They don't tell anybody about this stuff. It's, it's kept uh, secret uh, and it's not made uh, general public. So we did patches in February. Um, we came up to March, no patches. So unless you're telling me that Microsoft got all the patches done, I would have to assume that they're working on some still. So it, what happens is generally, they, they, when they can't get a patch ready in time for Patch Tuesday, it's not ready in time to be released, they just roll it over to the next month. So you know, give it 30 more days that possibly there's an exploit in the wild, that this situation exists out there. Somebody knows about it, because somebody usually reports it to Microsoft. Uh, so somebody probably has a, an idea of what's going on with the code. Uh, so some pros and cons there, right? It makes it a little easier for the IT guys to try to get their shop in order and plan the patching. But in general, it's, it's kind of opening this uh, window of vulnerability, the, the gap between when the uh, vulnerability is known and when the, the patch is actually out there. So let's talk about some of the juicy stuff. That's all background information. That's all good. Let's get into some of the problems and areas to start looking at here. In general, the easy stuff, this is process. This all has to do with how organizations do the patching. It has nothing to do with the technology itself. So any tool falls into a process-related problem. In a good world, in a perfect world, which doesn't happen hardly at all, this is kind of the way things should work. You know, the vendor finds the bug or gets notified about the bug. They're going to research it. They're going to fix it. They're going to test it. And then they're going to do the responsible thing, notify the customer, and they're going to release the patch. And then it's all happy and everybody's automatically patched, right? No. I mean, most people don't get patches rolled out in any kind of good time frame. Uh, what the customer, you know, should be doing, or we hope they do, is they get the patch. They're going to go ahead and validate that it's a, a decent patch and test in their own environment. Then they're going to go ahead and schedule it out and roll it out. And, then, and all this happens, hopefully, in a quick manner so that uh, the boxes are fixed as quick as possible. And then, you know, optimally, the customer might actually go back and update their production images so that any new boxes they're building are automatically getting rolled out with new, happy patched copies of the OS. Um, in the real world, almost none of that happens the way it should. So um, we have problems all the time with patches that come out that cause problems, right? Buggy patches happen. Uh, all kinds of funky scenarios that 
uh, couldn't come up with in a test plan, they couldn't run in a QA, they couldn't think of ahead of time, or they just didn't get that test done. Patches break things. That's why, whatever the fourth one down here, in terms of the customer receiving, validating, and testing the patch, Microsoft's pretty much, you know, thrown up their hands. They basically said, look, we can only do so much testing, we can only come up with so many permutations of, of how to screw things up. Uh, customer needs to take some responsibility and do some testing in their environment because customers screw things up in their environment, build their own applications, have funky hardened versions of uh, the OS that we can't come up with. And so there has to be some level, other level of testing. And this is a place that actually uh, some patch management vendors do actually provide some help with where they will actually get the information from Microsoft, they go through and test it, do a bunch of verification, then they roll it out to their customers. So uh, there is kind of an extra level in there that can sometimes help out. Um, you know, the general problem with finding the bugs and getting notified about the bugs, lots of good research going on, lots of good researchers out there finding lots of problems, so uh, we have no problems in that area there. Microsoft testing and validating, we still have some quality control issues there. Uh, customer notification, this is causing a lot of problems right now. Uh, Microsoft making a big announcement that they're going to let the federal government have early notice and access to all the patches before the rest of the world does. That threw everybody in a tizzy. The, the fact that the United States Air Force gets the patches and the information 30 days earlier than the rest of the planet was not necessarily a popular announcement that went out there. Um, the rest of the things come back to customer issues, implementation issues, the way we use patches and the way we roll them out there. Uh, so a lot of things in terms of how patching works or doesn't work in our environment, comes back to stuff that we're going to fix ourselves uh, in the process. Now the system is where we start to have some serious breakdowns here. Talk about some general characteristics of the patch management software distribution systems um, and generically how we work on the network and then we talk about where they're really broken. So you, you have two main types of systems. You have patch management specific systems. You know, spa specific guys, utility wise, guys who do this for a living. You have guys, you know, whether it's a, Shavlik, St. Bernard, uh, GFI, uh, you can even call uh, SUS in this category here. Things that they basically just affect pretty much patches. That's all they do. That's their job. Uh, then you've got the, the big behemoth guys, the infrastructure type guys. You've got the Novodimes, the Altiris, the SMSs, the LAN desks, uh, Zenworks. You've got uh, these large software distribution systems that can be used for anything from bare metal provisioning to rolling out OS. Uh, service packs down to a uh, single hotfix for the browser. Um, so you have two general types of tools out there. In general, the software distribution slash system management tools have much broader scope. They can do mass software distribution. They're usually designed for bigger scalability, and they can affect configuration changes other than uh, just the patch itself. So they will have the ability to do some changes out there. Maybe not everything you need, but they generally can make uh, some changes out there uh, and they generally will support the creation of custom packages. Most patch management specific tools don't give you much options in the way of creating your own content or making your own patch or tweaking your own uh, uh, stuff you're going to roll out there. Cool. So if I'm a regular end user, we'll just say okay, right? If we have problems with certificates, we just always click on okay, right? Everybody else does. That's never caused a problem before. Um, platform support. In general, uh, Windows 2000 and up. Uh, even SMS and SUS uh, not providing back level support. A few vendors still do NT4 support, not many. Um, Windows 9X, one or two. Uh, so if the more back level type system or down level system you have, the harder it is to get a commercial type tool out there. Uh, and if you've got, you know, mass numbers, thousands of these boxes out there, you're really getting kind of out of luck. You've got to get very creative, and we're messing with things on uh, uh, putting stuff out on shares and doing things with login scripts and trying to get uh, somewhere to get the package out there and get it executed. Um, architectural considerations or differences you see out there, uh, you generally get the two camps. The, we have the whole agent versus agentless uh, debate going on uh, for the agent-based guys. There'll be some sort of managed code on the remote box. Uh, that managed code usually gives you some advantages in terms of data compression, uh, encryption, uh, maybe some type of authentication, and then uh, uh, maybe some type of, uh, you know, fall over, fail safe, you know, the, uh, it dies in the middle of a patch or you need a rollback or something. Uh, agentless, you know, obviously the benefit is I don't have to roll anything out to thousands of boxes. Um, it's very quick. I can get stuff out there. But in general, you're limited on the communications in terms of what uh, 
how you can get the patches across the wire, what access you need, how open the remote box has to be for me to do all this installation across the network. Uh, and then it doesn't work in very good situations, things where things are firewalled off or you know, DMZ'd out. Um, mobile clients, huge problem. Uh, like I said before, uh, you, it's very hard to do patches on a mobile client because you don't know when the guy's going to get on the network. If the guy's just popping in on the VPN, check mail, he's gone, hard to do anything about it. And uh, because we have guys traveling with laptops all over the planet, plugging into all kinds of foreign networks, uh, it's very important to keep these guys up to date and patched up. It's just very hard to address them when they're not on the network consistently for us to easily access them and push you know, software at them. And remote distribution sites, generally it's a concept where the tool itself uh, doesn't want to download all the patches from Microsoft, store them in one place. They'll usually have them spread out across the network, uh, whether for geographic purposes, bandwidth uh, efficiencies, um, just to make them closer to the target boxes. Um, but this is usually having, instead of one separate repository of store patches, you're going to have multiple stores of patches uh, across the environment here. So you'll download them once, push them across your own network, and let your clients access them there. Uh, thanks to our friends at Microsoft for this graphic. Uh, generally, the way the new name of SUS, now WUS, now WSUS is, uh, works, but in generally, it's a very simple system, right? So uh, in, in general, you have the uh, SUS server, the SUS server talks directly uh, to MicrosoftUpdate.com, uh, pulls the patches, and then it handles the rollout uh, directly to the boxes. Um, the clients are configured uh, to talk to the SUS server. There's not a separate dedicated SUS client per se. It's already installed on the box. It's been there uh, for a while. It's just a matter of if you do have it turned on or not. So it's basically taking you know uh, the uh, Windows Update uh, functionality and plugging it into a corporate resource. So you basically have every client uh, pulling down a file down from the SUS server, uh, getting its information out there. Uh, but they're very simplistic rollouts. Uh, Microsoft has a very nice chart out on their website that shows uh, which systems you would use for which uh, types of environments. SUS is very small, maybe not even medium business-sized organizations. Uh, it has very limited functionality. Uh, it doesn't have kind of the scheduling or the reporting or the targeting capabilities that some other systems might have out there. Uh, it generically just is a, uh, an organized manner to do uh, larger scale Windows update type functions. Now SMS on the other hand, especially with the SMS feature pack, it's a lot more complex, actually terribly complex, and actually is one of the biggest problems we hear from customers. People tell me that yeah, SMS doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Or, you know, we've been working really hard on SMS and then we still don't have it working quite right. But SMS with a feature pack actually is quite complex. Uh, and it starts on the back end up at the top here with um, the particular host that uh, when you first do the installation, synchronizes and pulls down files and builds a repository. It also synchronizes to make sure you have the latest client and patches and fixes for SMS itself. Uh, it's tied into basically a set of scan tools or packages, basically leveraging MBSA uh, to do basically its targeting and discovery and generic assessment of uh, what's your name, where you're at, what service pack and OS are you running. Um, you target those client computers, schedule them out there, build packages, uh, roll them out, and uh, it has the ability to live update pull packages from uh, Microsoft.com. Though, interestingly enough, pulls from a different uh, URL than Windows Update or uh, the Download.com site. So there's actually, right now, at least, I think, three or four different download URLs from Microsoft, depending on who's pulling the patch and what kind of patch it is. Um, but SMS, in general, has quite a bit of functionality. Uh, we'll talk about some specific things in here. Microsoft has actually gone through and done quite a few good things in here in terms of the authentication, encryption, and digitally signing of the packages in most places out there. Now, one of the things we'll talk about is, is uh, at what point do you check for the integrity of the package? What, time, what places are you checking signatures at? And uh, when and where is the encryption and authentic authenticity of everything working? Because uh, what happens is a lot of the vendors are getting lazy or they don't do it at all and they check in the wrong places or they don't check all the way from the time they grab it from Microsoft all the way to the get to the target host. Um, communications, by default, RPC, DCOM type stuff. Your standard uh, Windows environment uh, works great on the regular network. If you're going to push out to the DMZ or anything that's firewalled off, this probably doesn't work quite so well. Um, sometimes you have problems with this and we'll talk about, uh, well, we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, and usually, um, they use HTTP as your update mechanism. Almost always, uh, it's pulling back from Microsoft uh, via HTTP. Uh, 
Sometimes you have optional communications. Products will let you do patching via HTTP, so it'll let you be a little more uh, interesting. I can control the port. I can deal with uh, firewall, DMZ type scenarios. Uh, I have more flexibility than RPC. Uh, encryption, um, a fair number of tools, not all the tools, and we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, do a fair job of uh, encrypting stuff out there. A lot of them uh, just use RPC, and, and if they're using RPC, about the only thing they're really relying on is, uh, say, the packet privacy switch thrown. So it's fair, uh, but the problem is, is for packet privacy, not only do you have to have it configured on the server side, but for every client you've talked to ahead of time. Um, by default, I think it's 40-bit, but it could be 128-bit, depending on the uh, OS you're communicating with. Um, authentication uh, is going to be a big area we have to talk about here because uh, some tools do authentication from the central server to the clients, and some tools don't. And uh, it leads to some very interesting situations where you might be able to uh, uh, goof some stuff up. Uh, even worse than that, the integrity checking issue. Microsoft digitally signs just about everything coming down from the sky. Uh, pretty hard to, to muck with that and, and mess with it, though not impossible, because some of the tools are checking for digital signatures when the packages come down. Some of the tools that we looked at so far don't check for the signature on the package. They're not even bothering to look. If I talk to download.microsoft.com and ask for a, you know, such and such file name.exe and you give it to me, uh, that must be the right file. And so they'll happily accept it and take it down, bring it into the repository and let you distribute it out. Some tools, well only two so far, check for the signature. They just check for a signature. Is it signed? Sure. Okay, thanks. It doesn't matter if I signed it, you signed it, or Microsoft signed it. They're just seeing, is there a signature present? So in essence, it does no good. It, they just want to make sure that it's, that, that must be the definition of checking to see if it's signed. And they're not actually valid, seeing if it's signed by somebody valid, just checking to see if there's a signature in place. So the big problem that we have here, uh, there's probably a couple of ones. One, the biggest one I think is on the authentication side. The one that we've, we've noticed so far, mostly on the small utility side guys. The big software distribution guys, whether it's the Altiris, SMS, Landis type guys, usually have gotten this already out of control because most of these guys use a, an agent out there. Uh, so the authentication standpoint, they usually do a better job in terms of central server says, I've got a package to push to you. I'm the only guy who can send this package to you. Please accept this package. And the client you know, validates that and happily accepts the package. Uh, a lot of the little guys, specifically the kind of fly-by-night patch management tools, um, a couple of them don't even bother to check. If you talk to it on the right port and have the package in the right format, it happily takes a package. Um, some of them authenticate one way, but don't authenticate back the other way. And when we talk at the very, at the very end about other interesting, nasty things you can do, there's actually a real interesting uh, a denial of service that you can do with that. Um, integrity checking, like I mentioned here, the problem is, is that um, it's not just an issue for the signatures, and actually, let's just go on that one. That's where I got it. Signature issue, the integrity checking. The problem is, is that not everybody checks the signatures. Not everybody checks to make sure it's a valid signature. Nobody, except one, I think, one, one, checks the signature all the way from the source to the server through the distribution point to the target host. Not one. Well, the one does. But um, So generally, what that means is once you download it from Microsoft and validate it, it's OK, and it's in my patch repository, that's cool. Now that I want to push it out to my clients, I'm not going to go back and double check that package. I'm not going to check it when I move it to my distribution points. I'm not going to check it when I move it out to the client. Client doesn't do any validation. Uh, it does authentication. Yes, you're, you're totally legit to talk to me. Please send me all you want. What it sends to them, though, is totally wide open. Uh, and there's a couple places this happens. One, bad design, flaw, commercial packages, stuff from Microsoft. But the other problem is the fact that a lot of these tools on the software distribution side support custom packages or repackaging. Microsoft sends you a cab file of the patch. It's digitally signed. If you create your own package, it's just there. It's just a package. There's no way to validate it that it's, that it's the real patch from Adobe or that it's something good or it's something bad. If I push you the package and I'm authenticated, I'm the guy who's allowed to push you the package, and this system supports custom packages, all kinds of funky can, stuff can happen. And this has happened a lot with things like SMS in the past. SMS administrators can tell you all kinds of great horror stories about 
messing up the package that they built, pushing out a bad package to their environment, and crashing boxes left and right. Happens a lot. If you create a custom package, you are now the guy fully in charge of the security testing, you know, the, the uh, compatibility of the software package. So uh, you have to have the ability uh, to actually do this right and, and get the information out there. So um, in terms of the packages, when it gets to the client side, we don't have a signature to check now. So if I repackage this, there's nothing to validate at the client, even if the client was designed to do so. Um, there's also some other problems. We've discovered a couple of ones that have uh, very weak default access to control set to the package repositories. Uh, so the packages have been downloaded, they're verified, they're trusted, they're stored in a directory, and boom, that's it. Then it turns out that uh, access to those directories is relatively wide open. Um, that if you can get an account, maybe not even an administrative account, but a regular account, you may be able to access the directory out there and see the packages. Substitute a package. Maybe I edit a package. Um, some of the products actually have built-in roles that define which accounts are in different groups, and these roles have specific access signed out there. But the problem is, is that they're very weak in uh, how the roles get set up or who they put in there. And SMS has this problem from an implementation issue. A lot of people jam a lot of people into the SMS roles and give them access to roll out stuff they're not supposed to. A lot of the roles also have a problem with being very granular in terms of defining uh, it's kind of an on or off switch. I can roll out packages, but they don't go uh, detailed level enough to what packages I can roll out or maybe even what specific boxes I can go to. Some of the tools basically is just I'm a good user of the tool or not a user of the tool. So there's some, some very interesting uh, things you can mess with there in terms of compromising the roles. Now, uh, I talked about the custom packaging and building your own stuff. The other problem we've noticed is that a lot of the tools have trouble telling you what version that patch is. And the problem is, is Microsoft does this kind of bait and switch on the binary a lot, where they've done a patch, released it, and then fixed it again and slid it back under the covers again. So if you actually look at the, like one of the DLLs in there, it's actually a different version, but it's still the same patch name, distribution number, it's still being marketed as you know patch for MSO 504. And some of the tools can't tell the difference. Uh, it knows it, it, it saw it was MSO 504, but a new one comes out and it says you don't need the new patch. It might be a new patch, uh, but if Microsoft slid a new DLL in there, all it knows is that, hey, I already pushed MSO 504 out the door. And it's back again to the tools not being able to have very good detailed configuration information on the remote box, being able to actually look at the registry, all the DLLs, the file system, the permissions out on the box and saying, okay, what really needs to be out on the box, not just some simple query out there that says, hey, what service pack are you running? Um, so, this is one of the tools, and actually this is a Microsoft bug, and SMS falls for this one, and this is actually documented. So, SMS actually has, a, has a, a problem with getting a little confused about what patch it really is pushed out on the box, uh, especially if the patch says it's the same patch and then you're trying to roll it back out again. So, let's talk about a couple of ways to implement or take some of this stuff and break uh, some different things out here. We've got two specific kind of scenarios, kind of a generic internal scenario uh, and then a generic external scenario. Uh, this is by no means comprehensive. This is some of the areas that we're going to probably have the most fun playing with in, in upcoming months. And, you know, if we have our, our say and we get done in time, then we'll probably have a real interesting update to talk about at Black Hat USA. But um, so we'll do two of them. You can come up with a lot more suggestions. I bet you'll come up with a lot more creative ways to to abuse these in here. Uh, internal side. On the internal side, you're going after the patch repository. The patch repository, if you can muck with the patch, switch it out, uh, slide something in the door, that's what you want to do. So in this case here, uh, we can do easy things like we're going to, you know, we're looking for credentials. Uh, if I can get a credential and get me an access easy account, either it's directly into the file share or get me into a role to access uh, a patch distribution system, great. Uh, you know, a service account, uh, most of the patch big patch management systems that use uh, agents out there run with a standardized service account across the entire environment. Um, so I want to get access in there. If I can uh, get through either, you know, improperly uh, pulling up some credentials off the wire um, or uh, getting into some weak act ACLs, that's great. I just want to be able to get in and mesh with the package. If I can mesh with the package, especially if it's a tool set that doesn't validate from the distribution point back out, you know, it's downloaded the patch from Microsoft. It said it was good. It blessed it. It checked it. Dropped it down in directory, and then it just sits there. If I had the ability to go muck with that, and it doesn't know the difference now because it hasn't generated its own hash, it doesn't go reback, 
revalidate the signatures, or even at the end where the agent doesn't check for it, I can sneak something in the door. Uh, if you get a system that actually has uh, very little validation at the distribution point uh, from the server to the agent at all, uh, you might be able to try some interesting man in the middle type stuff. Maybe we can substitute a package in there, especially if it does very weak or poor authentication uh, or the tools that actually don't validate that it's a trusted person to talk to. Uh, I can go and spoof the central server and say, hey, Mr. Agent, I happen to have patches delivering for you. Would you please accept these? Um, all of these are much easier to do if you're on the inside of the network. So if you're the disgruntled guy or you're just the pissed off patch management guy and you want a new job, uh, fun places to play with. The end, the end result is that the system is owned, but not so much of the fact that it's owned. It, there's two big outcomes of that. Uh, great to own the system. What are you going to do with it? One, I can use that tool to cause mass damage inside the environment. So I can push things that shouldn't be pushed out there, invalid patches, Trojans, all kinds of uh, interesting code. Maybe if it's a tool that makes configuration changes, I can start whacking registry keys. Uh, I can cause you know, all kinds of interesting tools that's up there. But it takes away the tool from the organization. If you own their patch management system, what are they going to do to fix it? What are they going to do to fix, if you take SMS off the wire and you've used it to attack the environment, what tool are they going to now use to go out and fix 5,000 workstations? They don't have a tool left. They don't have another tool to go back out there. What are they going to do? Go buy a, go, you know, go buy a whole new copy of Alteris for 5,000 uh, nodes and go back and reinstall that across all 5,000 machines so they can get them back? Ghost 5,000 machines? Uh, you've taken away their number one band-aid. So uh, it's not so much that you can use the tool to cause damage out there, but you've taken away their number one triage material. So no matter, even if you do something little to the box, uh, not even catastrophic, they still have no way to go out and do something about it. The external scenario gets a little more interesting. And actually, uh, in the next few pages, this is where um, we talk about it, where it might be very interesting to bring in the Trojan patch. Um, so in this scenario, what you do is you wait till uh, Patch Tuesday comes up. And specifically, you want to take advantage of a scenario where there's something really bad going on in the world. Uh, because when bad things go on in the world, lots of people download lots of patches and download them rather urgently. Um, you know, places like Akamai and other, you know, big DNS have been messed with before. You know, you can redirect some things. There's a couple of particular places that you want to play with. So if you can, even for a limited amount of time, muck with some URLs like windowsupdate.com, download.windows.com, uh, fill in the third party vendor name.com that supports you the patches. That's a good start. Most of these guys are going up looking for uh, hitting a uh, URL, a uh, happy little you know, HTTP call up there, uh, get you know, some happy package from there. Um, to be well effective, obviously, you're going to wait till the, the highest probability, the largest number of people are going to come online and be trying to do this. Now, this is where you can bring in something like a Trojan patch. Now, a good Trojan patch actually fixes the problem it's intended to. It'll go out there and actually fix the problem. So when you download the patch and you roll it out and the problem seems to be fixed, customer feels happy and safe and would have no reason to suspect that something was Trojan done uh, inside that binary. Um, you know, pick the payload of choice, uh, whatever you know, cool little uh, toy of the day that you have, or what you know, really outstanding zero day that you have access to. Uh, this could be a real interesting way to get it in the door. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. You throw netcat listeners out there. I mean, get something in the door. Um, now, if we're dealing with the right tools, you could sign it. It doesn't have to be a Microsoft signature. Uh, you can pretend to be a Microsoft. It could be Microsoft.com uh, with a nice verified, you know, signature from VeriSign that this is indeed Microsoft.com. Um, few of the tools are checking. When they download, the major tools do. Microsoft does, SMS, SUS does. But some tools are not validating, like I said before, validate the signature of the package when it downloads at all. If I can hit a URL with HTTP, I ask for a package, and I get a package back, that's all it's looking for. So if I give it a package, even if the tool checks for the download uh, for a signature, it's the, the couple of the tools aren't checking for the legitimacy of that signature. So it has a signature on it, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, it can be signed by anybody. So um, you're not going to get everybody. You won't get mass spread panic. But you can get a large number of vendors. You can get a large number of customers on those vendors. Uh, you'll miss big guys like, say, an SMS or an Altiris. Uh, but very small shops, 
uh, or even big shops who've gone on the cheap to buy little utilities and try to push them out to their environment. This is a, a way that havoc could be caused. Um, you know, we haven't seen a good example of this yet. Doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. And I think actually as uh, we get some more research done and we get some of this stuff published, a lot of guys will be pushing hard, pretty hard to fix. You're always going to run those and vendor, vendors who are going to be stubborn and refuse to fix it or cry foul and or threaten to sue or, or come back with whatever you know, recourse they want. So uh, you can imagine that some, some vendors won't get a patch out before the word gets out their specific tool and their vulnerability. So um, in this case here, because of lacks of controls on authentication uh, and or uh, the digital signatures, it's pretty easy to try to spoof a package in the door out there. Now, some of these tools, I also forgot to mention on the encryption side, are pretty weak. Some of these tools are actually just passing things in clear text, uh, including uh, authentication to the, the remote box to get stuff off of there. So you don't have uh, uh, always great data being passed. You've know, you got the payload and the authentication going across the wire. So real quick, as we wrap it up on the other evil deeds, I can, you can Trojan stuff, you can get your own packages in there, you can create all kinds of interesting stuff. And I think that's going to be probably the most fun, but there's some other things that you can do. Obviously, if you control the, the system, I can just flood the network with packages. I make my own SQL Slammer. I do you know, whatever I need to. I consume bandwidth. I'm just going to push XP, SP2, you know, five copies a day to every machine on the network. At 150 megs a whack, that's a pretty good way to chew up some uh, network space. More interesting one is actually uh, DOSing the patch management system itself. And so this one is actually real, valid, and published on Microsoft.com. So uh, anybody go to listen to the Johnny's Google talk this morning? OK, so use your book or use your notes. Go out and do some nice, crafty uh, Google queries and start looking for stuff on um, uh, anonymous authentication issues between server and agent. Uh, the generic issue is, and uh, it really cracked me up when we found this on the research, um, Microsoft knows about it and has published it, and it's not, it, the answer is it's by design. Uh, the box talks to the agent, that's authenticated. The agent sends status messages back to the server on a quite regular basis, anonymously. There is no authentication. Um, so it's quite easy to basically overwhelm the SMS server by sending plethoras of uh, status messages. I'm an agent, I'm an agent, I'm an agent, I'm an agent, and all my friends are agents, and by the way, you know, 10 to the 10th hour are agents, and you basically basically keep SMS too busy to do anything. Um, so once again, you've taken, uh, you may not use it to cause damage, but you've taken SMS off the wire, and what are they going to use to go out and fix boxes across the network? Nothing. They, they don't have another tool in hand. So um, this is actually in a tech bulletin. It's sitting on Microsoft.com, and their standard answer is, is we built it that way. Um, you own tools that can do mass scale changes and push software out there. Uh, how easy is it to push a bogus registry setting and crash a box? You're talking about an enterprise scalable with fault tolerance, redundancy, the ability to retransmit, uh, deal on low bandwidth scenario, blue screen of death. It's a fantastic system for mass destruction. They've built some really cool things in these tools in terms of bit support, uh, rollback, uh, supporting for dial-up lines, support multiple protocol support, all kinds of interesting ways to get your data across the wire. Make sure that that change absolutely gets there overnight, whether it's a good change or not. So um, leverage the system to disable other host security. I'm going to go out there and turn the antivirus off. I'm going to turn Microsoft's spyware beta off. Uh, I will you know, take out the DAT file. I will do something to cause a problem. You want to cause a problem with semantic antivirus? Just go out and delete the registry keys. It'll die the first time you do a live update, real quick, or the first time it actually does any kind of scan on the file system. And actually, it's very hard to uninstall and fix and upgrade. And we have to do basically a, a rip and replace and gut it and look for all the little registry turtlets all, all across the system. Um, all you have to do is delete a couple registry keys. Um, last caveat, this affects just Microsoft, right? No, come on. I mean, there are very few commercial patch management systems on Linux and Unix. But most of the guys who build the bad stuff on Microsoft are the same guys building stuff on the Linux and Unix side. And the bigger problem is, is that how do most Unix, Linux admins, how do you patch the boxes out there? Do it yourself. I wrote a shell script. I'm the king of package ad. You know, I know RPM inside out. 
Most people do it themselves. Onesies, twosies, I script it, I do it myself, right? So one, a lot of guys, for whatever reason, we did a survey, we talked to a bunch of Unix guys, why does everybody not validate patch signatures? Because it takes a lot of time, it's a lot of effort. Yeah, I run into a lot of patch guys patching Unix boxes who don't look at signatures. And the Unix vendors are great, they provide a hash for every binary on the box, but they don't validate signatures because it takes extra time. So if you don't have a tool, an automated tool system that's validating it, if you just built it into your shell script, if you just built a system to mass get files out there real quick and kick off mass RPM jobs, you're going to run into some of the same situations. You might have the ability uh, to be distributing a bad patch out there. Uh, you get a bad package out there that's not valid or authenticated out there. And because you, if you buy a commercial system, then you might have to deal with some of the same guys making screwy Windows software. So um, the right thing to do, last slide, just, you know, obviously we fix the process. The process needs to be f defined, especially the parts where customers test uh, and roll the staff out in a timely manner. Um, that has to be defined and well executed in an organization. That's just the way it has to work. Quarantining solutions. Quarantining solutions are very popular these days, and it's because they address a really interesting need. That window of vulnerability between the, when the patch comes out uh, and, and when the patch was announced. And in that window, I have a time when the box is totally vulnerable and I have nothing to do about it. Anybody remember Burbu? Burbu came out, the world knew about it, and they were told there was going to be a patch for another four weeks. In the meantime, everybody's got massive problems with it. Uh, you need something in the meantime to be able to address that issue. Uh, quarantine systems are very popular right now. So whether you're looking at any kind of uh, 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 syscall, trapping, uh, kernel proxy type stuff, whether it's, you know, intercept, Okina, that kind of stuff, uh, is going to be very popular. You're seeing a lot of vendors come up with that. I expect to see most of the desktop firewalls go that way. Uh, you know, guys like uh, EI have put out uh, things like Blink. Um, a lot more tools coming that way. All the antivirus guys will be going that way. You're going to see antivirus uh, just become an all-encompassing kind of security agent and dump all kinds of stuff in there. Um, ACLs and roles, okay. Duh, uh, bad access control is always bad, so fix the permissions and make sure only the right people have the right access, particularly on where the files are stored, the patch repository, if it's a single place, if it's multiple distribution points, anywhere where you've downloaded a copy, once that file is downloaded, to keep it trusted, you've got to keep it locked down. And if you don't, then you know, you're just asking to get some, somebody to do something about it. Validating signatures all along the stage, all the way from the source to your distribution center, all the way to the agent is mandatory. And if you get a tool that doesn't do that, it's bad technology. You've got to have a way to make sure that nowhere along the way has the integrity of that package been compromised. The other thing, if people are going to start mucking with network services, then you need to be keeping an eye on it. That's just good practice. Everybody knows that. You know, you know Dan's talking. Uh, you know, Dan will tell you more about DNS than you want to know. Um, making sure that you've taken care of those kind of things on the network are just common sense. Any kind of good security practices, defense in depth. You're just not going to rely on patch management for everything. And if I've got to use the network to traverse data across and move packages across, of course I need to make sure that that network's not compromised as well. The last one is the one that we're really trying to drive and we hope the research that we're working on and that the stuff we'll get to publish actually will drive a bunch of vendors to fix some stuff. Whether it's better authentication, encryption, uh, signature validation, just to do a better job in terms of keeping the data safe and making sure the packages get pushed out across the board. Like I said, amazingly enough, Microsoft actually made probably the most progress on this, maybe because they've been burned enough or they've just done SMS and had miserable failures with it for years, uh, but they've actually done uh, some of the best jobs, at least in terms of a mass spread of data going across the environment out there. In the end, yeah, we, there's lots of problems that persist. We haven't made it through all 20 vendors yet. Uh, we've already found lots of interesting things in just a handful of vendors. We expect to find a lot more. Uh, and so it's going to get a lot more interesting, uh, especially as details get done. Um, organizations can't rely too heavily on patching. Patching's mandatory, but it can't be your only answer for securing the box. Uh, host security just takes a lot more than having it patched. Um, do something now instead of waiting for bad things to happen. Patch management is so very reactive. We usually wait till you know, fire is set to the organization before we get these things rolled out. And then, of course, vendors need to keep on top of this and always build better code. So. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here for a little while. Steve, myself, contact information, uh, especially if you have some more interesting ideas or behaviors that we've seen, we'd love to hear from you, uh, especially so we can get some more stuff out and get something published uh, 
with uh, specific details at the next Black Hat. So that's it. Thanks. Whatever time. It Any questions? You can come up here. Oh, by the way, even if I won't give you details out loud or put it in the presentation, that doesn't mean you can't come talk to me offline or catch me in the bar somewhere. <laughs>